Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, Utah's Republicans elect a slate of young leaders to shepherd the party forward during a tumultuous convention. First Lady Jill Biden visits our state to recognize teachers and promote the country's vaccine efforts. And as the state reaches legislative benchmarks in curbing the pandemic, many statewide restrictions are lifted. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Natalie Gochner, director of the Kem C. Gardner Policy Institute at the University of Utah. Ben Winslow, reporter with Fox 13 News, and Lindsay Whitehurst, reporter with the Associated Press. Thank you so, so much for being with us tonight. A uh, lot of things happening in the world, in the country, in Utah. I wanna get to a convention. Ben, we're gonna start with you. That was a convention. It was, you were there. So the Republicans met this past weekend on Saturday. We read some of the reporting, some of yours. Tell us about, well, tell us about the, the event itself because this was not like a lot of others we have seen. A lot of emotion, uh, you know, a lot of drama even maybe. A lot of stuff happening at this convention. It was the first in-person political convention in more than a year because of the pandemic. Of course, mask wearing was, well, kind of mixed. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there was the main event with uh, Senator Mitt Romney getting booed by the delegates to his own party. Well, I want to get into some of that. So Mitt Romney booed, governor being booed. We're going to talk about for that for just a, just a second, because Lindsay, as, as you've done some reporting and your colleagues on this as well, what's interesting is uh, new leadership was elected here and we have a brand new chair. Uh, the outgoing chair, Derek Brown, uh, was not, not going to go forward in that particular job. They elected Carson Jorgensen. Talk about him for a second, some of what we know about him and a little, maybe a little view about how he's going to manage this new job. Well, he was a bit of a surprise. This was considered kind of an upset win. He was not necessarily the favorite, but he's he's young, uh, 31 years old, I think, and so it's all millennial leadership of the the Utah GOP, which is which is another interesting aspect of it. And um, there's some things about his leadership that sort of remain to be seen. Um, one thing that that he said is um, he uh, is not a big fan of SB 54. This was the the law that um, that allowed people to gather signatures to get on the ballot instead of only going the convention route. So we we may see some renewed efforts on on that one it seems like they've um the the party has kind of come to the end of the legal road already um but perhaps in the legislature um so we'll see it seems like that 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 theme is going to to keep going and, and he's going to make sure that that it, it won't be something that gets forgotten about. Right. So, N Natalie, you've been involved in many conventions over the years. Uh, you've been to them and you've been through many of these leadership races itself. Uh, what do you think about the fact that uh, what Lindsay was saying is, is accurate? Uh, there isn't a single member now in the leadership there that's well over the age 35. This is a very young group of people. A couple of them have run for office uh, unsuccessfully in the past. But what do you make of the fact that this particular s slate of people were elected by the delegates. Well, I think the fact that they're young is uh, really interesting, right? I want to see them succeed and thrive in their roles. Uh, the questions I would be asking is, can they raise money? Uh, can they organize? And can they build a big enough tent to attract mainstream Republicans? And that's the real challenge that they're going to face. I love their youth, but they've got to be able to deliver for the party. Yeah, so, so Natalie, to that, to that great point, as Derek Brown was going out, he was talking about the person that they should select, that the party should select to lead it forward. And there are a couple key themes of what you just said in his very quote. I want to read it and just kind of get your comment about it from uh, Derek Brown, because he was kind of given a warning uh, based on what you just said as well. This is what he said. The luxury of a supermajority can also allow a party to be, to be sloppy and unfocused and still win elections. My concern is we may not have that luxury in the next five to 10 years. And whether that is the case, that is the case has everything to do with the party remaining strong and as you said, funded. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would say that, you know, the core tenets of the Republican party, a limited government, fiscal restraint, a free enterprise, free trade, balanced federalism, we're not talking about those. And that's a real problem moving forward because Republicans that believe in a conservative ideology are struggling with where they fit. 
Mm -hmm. So we saw that, Ben, what, what you started talking about this on the program here. So this supermajority we have in the state of Utah and the Republican Party, many may say, you know, you have so many people here, you hold all these statewide positions, you know, they're just going to be, they're going to stay in power. And Derek is maybe signaling you can't really take that for granted. That was a theme that was brought up by the speakers uh, from a leadership on down, all at the convention, which was they were warning that states around Utah are flipping blue. And there seemed to be a real paranoia that this could happen here. And they kept warning about that repeatedly, just saying, we could be next. This is why you need to pick this person or you need to pick mm -hmm. this person, or this is why we need to maintain our hold in federal uh, offices and statewide offices offices. You do wonder with the shifting demographics in Utah if we're starting to go a little purple even though we are still very red. Mm -hmm. That is true. What about that funding part right there? Because if, if some of that core leaves, you know, in your supermajority, you have one end of the spectrum that is all in on a couple of these candidates, but you have the other end of the spectrum that is just not with these delegates anymore. What happens to that funding and their ability to really uh, financially help the candidates going forward? Well, we elected as Republican Party leadership a group of millennials, but do they have money? And you need money to win elections, and you need money to pay for the signs, the advertisements, all of those things. The question that I wonder is if, because a lot of the state leadership-backed candidates didn't win, does the money get pulled back? And is the new incoming leadership of the Republican Party having to do more grassroots or having to at least make some concessions to the people with the bigger pocketbooks? Yeah. All this is playing. Jason and Ben, I, I want to make the link here, though. There's a link here between fundraising and your policies, right? And so many of our business leaders uh, look for a more pragmat, you know, pr more pragmatism in in our conservatism, and they look for solutions. They don't look for rhetoric. They don't look for you know booing at conventions. They look for people that that want to have limited government and uh, an inclusive party. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to be able to raise money. So it, it to me, it's it's very it has very much an ideology connection as much as just you know are they grassroots? Well, so Lindsay, to this, to this very great point about the ide ideology and the policy. Um, a little bit of a showdown already, maybe a signal for that with with who sets that. Because of course, once they get elected, they set the policy. The Republican Party is trying to set some of those priorities as well. But we saw sort of a a text that shows uh, an ideology even from the new chair, where where, the, where Jorgensen is saying uh, we need to make sure going forward that we show that uh, the legislature and the governor is beholden to the party. The party is not beholden to those those elected officials. You know, the folks that tend to 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 be at convention tend to be further right. They tend to be um, very conservative and that, that section of the party. One of the reasons why you've seen Mitt Romney not only this time, but at other points too, not have the warmest reception. Um, you know, he's seen him as more moderate, voted for the impeachment of Donald Trump. And so so there can be a little bit of a, of a disconnect there. Um, one thing I think that's kind of cool about the convention system is you don't necessarily need a lot of money to come in and get people's attention. You know, you can have your booth and you can talk to a relatively small group of people and convince folks to come come over to your point of view just on that one-on-one -on -one kind of mm -hmm. classic <laughs> political basis but partly because it's a very long day, it's a lot of time, you have the people who are most passionate about a certain point of view, and that, that of course, tends to be that, that furthest right. So, so there can be a little bit of a disconnect when you go out into the wider electorate, which, which does tend to be a little more moderate. And so, so that you have, to, you have to balance all those factors, right? I mean, there is a little bit of a divide in the Utah Republican Party. There has been, among Utah Republicans anyway, there has been a, a divide, and, and yes, it's coincided with, with with Donald Trump, and so so you have to balance all those competing interests. It's a uh, it's a tall order. <laughs> it is. Well, and to that point, though, the the motion to censure Senator Romney failed narrowly, but it still failed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's get to that point too, because I want to get your insight, Natalie, about the booing. So Ben just talked about it, and uh, you know, so, so they're they're booing some people that are pretty popular in the state of Utah. You look at Governor Cox, for example. His his approval numbers have gone up every single month since he's been in office. He's around 66% in the last poll that we did, yet even he was booed with this particular group. Give us some historical perspective because this is not necessarily new at these conventions. <laughs> well, I, you know, I worked with uh, former governor Mike Levitt and, you know, he was a very popular governor. When he ran for his third uh, term uh, in office at the convention, he got booed. 
if I remember correctly, the issue was uh, guns in schools and churches, and then also some RS-2477 road issues. Yeah. But he was forced into a primary, and uh, you know it, it horrified those of us that worked so closely with the governor because he had an 80% plus approval rating. Uh, but there's an important lesson here, and he would tell you that he learned something. He got too far away from some of the sentiment of important folks in the base mm -hmm. and in the party. And so there's always a... Uh, a debate that goes on in the governor's office about about how you need to be touching the people and connecting with the people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, Lindsay, uh, you mentioned a point here that people are talking about already after this. If, uh, if if you tend to have more conservative people there that are the delegates that are showing up than and then we have in sort of the, the more moderate Republicans in the state of Utah. There's been a, uh, some question about how these new officials are going to approach that Senate Bill 54. Mm -hmm. The thing that allows uh, candidates to, to do the signature gathering route, because some of these more moderate candidates might not fare very well with that particular group, and that's been the argument all along. What are you hearing about uh, the, our new leadership here in the Republican Party and how they're going to approach that issue? Well, that's going to be an interesting thing going forward, right? What what do you do about this? In the past, the leadership has taken the court route, and that that hasn't hasn't gone their way, and has been expensive. Back to the money question, right? And and what do you spend your money on, and how do you get that money? Um, but there have been some legislative efforts uh, in this last session, um, although they didn't didn't get all the way to the finish line by a long stretch. But but we could see that come back, and perhaps there's a, a legislative route to change part of that bill, and we'll see how how popular that idea is once you get into a little bit wider setting. So far, that those efforts have been unsuccessful, that, that candidates who gather signatures to get on the ballot do tend to be more moderate, and they do tend to win when it comes to a general election. So um, so that's going to be a really interesting uh, back and forth. Yeah, it, it, def it definitely is. Uh, one of the, th the themes that came up with that particular group on Saturday, and we're seeing across the country, Ben, is, I'll, I'll just call it the Trump factor. Even in Washington, D.C., and with our, our, our Senate, for example, is asking, uh, uh, to what extent is there still a Trump factor in that Republican Party? Get, uh, you're interviewing lots of people about these kinds of things. What's your sense of it? Uh, is the Republican Party c still connected to former President Trump? And how, you know, how essential is he going to be or not be in the next election cycle? I think it's what everybody's still trying to figure out right now is how much does that help or hurt you because President Trump was a very polarizing figure. And for even Republicans, it's does it help or does it hurt you? And, and do his policies, do you align with those? Do you take the more Utah approach to things, which tends to be a more moderate in tone approach? Um, I, I th what we saw, I think, at Saturday's convention was that being wrestled amongst the delegates themselves. Again, a lot of sentiment against uh, Senator Romney for his impeachment votes, but yet the motion to censure fails. You see also um, different who gets picked as far as state party leadership. You know, that, that seems to attract a more populist sentiment, which seems to go along the lines mm -hmm. of, you know, how President Trump uh, ran the party or, or at least had, you know, involvement in the party. But then you see how the state typically handles other things. And then you have like leaders like uh, Governor Cox, who tends to take a more moderate tone. So I think what you're seeing is this all just getting hashed out in public view. Yeah, what, one of the areas uh, this week was on national TV, one of our own, uh, our former elected official, uh, Congresswoman Mia Love. So Na Natalie, I just wanted to get, to get your thoughts about that because she has really been out there talking about President Trump, really asking whether or not he is worth it to the Republican Party for the toll that some of the candidates are taking, but what some of the other candidates are going to need to do to go forward to really try to stay connected. And that's what you're talking about. Stay connected to that core part of the party, right. which is what some feel compelled to do. Yeah, right. You know, I'm a Republican woman who just cheers every time I see uh, Mia Love on CNN as one of their correspondents, uh, you know, from Saratoga Springs, Utah, commenting on things. And she's basically saying, you know, it's wrong to have a party that's personality based. We should be, you know, based in ideology and on principles that uh, will make our country great. So she's, I've, I've really applauded what she's been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have a high level official talking about the administration because the Democrats are put, put out their own plans. Uh, and a lot of them are coming through various stimulus packages, infrastructure, uh, but particularly about education and the vaccine. Lindsay, talk about this very high profile visit we just got from uh, the first lady of the United States, Dr. Uh, Jill Biden. 
Right, yeah, she came and she visited a school in Salt Lake City, one of the most diverse schools in the state. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's it's an interesting thing. The Biden administration is, is, is trying to nudge more schools in the U.S. towards reopening. And here in Utah, most of our schools have been reopened since the fall, but um, nationally, it's closer to, you know, like 60%, something like that. So, so just over half. So that means that there's a significant portion of schools that haven't reopened yet. And um, of course, you have to do that safely and keep everybody safe in your school environment. But we also know there there are some, some bad outcomes for kids if, if things stay online. That doesn't work for every kid, and so there can be some real challenges there too. So, so in that, and, and we have some good public health data that indicates if these precautions are taken at school, school can be a safe place for kids, you know, relatively speaking in this, in this world that we're in right now. So the Biden administration has been kind of nudging schools to reopen, and that wasn't necessarily an explicit topic of conversation uh, when, when Jill Biden made her remarks, which are, you know, respecting teachers, all the terrific work they've done during this crazy year, and, and of course, pro-vaccination. But, but that was sort of, there's a, there's a subtext there, I think, and as we're talking as a country, like, the, the Biden administration would like to see more more schools reopening and, and more vaccination rates are going to help that. So how, how is this message being received? How was it yesterday? Oh, go, go ahead, Natalie. Well, I just wanted to ask Lindsay, Ben, you, Jason, do we know why she came? And the reason I'm asking that is, you know, I've worked in Washington. I've watched how cabinet members, you know, in this case, the first lady do their strategic scheduling. But we don't typically get visits this early. Uh, especially in a in a Republican dominated state from a first lady. And I'm just asking the question, what, what made them uh, make this visit to our state? If I were gonna guess, so this was part of a Western swing. She also stopped in Nevada and, and in Colorado too, which which are more democratic states than, than Utah is, right? If I were gonna, strategic scheduling, right? those make sense. Yeah, <laughs> if I were gonna guess, I would say that this was a way to highlight a school. Uh, one thing, the schools that have not reopened in the US, there are more students of color who are still learning online. So. If I were going to guess, I would say, look, here's a school where it's a very diverse population. It's reopened. We've seen student grades improve at, at Glendale Middle, and so, so I, if I, if I were her strategist, which I am not, and they are not whispering in my ear, just to be clear, <laughs> um, I, that's what I would say: is, hey, you can go to the school, and you can, you can highlight how when schools reopen with this this diverse student population, here are some good outcomes we can have. Yeah, so, so Ben, maybe just we'll comment from you because we've talked. I've talked with you about this in the past. It would have been really easy to. She was heading to Nevada. It would have been really easy to just fly over the state of Utah. But but more and more often, people do touch down here for a moment. Well, I think it's uh, you. You can signal to leadership, even in the opposing party, we're willing to work with you on some things, too. Mm -hmm. Making that visit, making that connection. You know, our door is open to listen. Of course, to Governor you. Cox meeting her and the first yes, lady. Yes, and the first lady. They're both there, as well as members of the federal moment. congressional delegation. Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was interesting to see uh, all sides of the aisle all there, and particularly on two issues that both parties are quite interested in. You know, it's a it's a good sign sometimes when you see people just really want to be in Utah to see the Utah approach to things, particularly since something happened this last weekend on the Utah approach to things, the end game. That's right. Okay, we, we had this bill during the legislative session, House Bill 294. So, so Natalie, uh, let's talk about it for just a moment because uh, as Representative Paul Ray, it was like if we hit certain metrics in the state of Utah, it was kind of controversial at the time. We Thanos <laughs> snapped that pandemic. <laughs> ben, ben has called it. But but there are a couple of things like, you know, it was like the 14 day case rate, for example, the ICU utilization, the number of vaccines, the allocation that went out. So we've hit those, Natalie, this past week, the least of the ones that were set out by statute. But I guess, I guess the question is kind of what we just got from Ben. You know, that's kind of just overnight we hit the metrics. And I guess the now what? Uh, you know, what, what, what does that <laughs> well, mean? I love. I love seeing our state being data driven. I love that we're, you know, coming out of this. I, I will say that I attended the University of Utah's convocation yesterday, and it was a moment of light because we're back uh, doing things. We were very careful. Normally, we're in the Huntsman Center. We were at Rice Eccles outside, but we celebrated in the David Eccles School of Business some amazing graduates, and uh, it just reminded me of how we're getting there. Yeah, well, we clearly are. And Liz, you're, you're interviewing these officials there. Uh, how is, has anything changed really kind of over that night? We hit these metrics. And so a lot of the restrictions are gone, but what remains? 
a few things. There is, of course, a number of private businesses that are still requiring masks, and, and there are a few other places. Uh, schools, of course, are the big one, and, and that, that has been controversial among a certain to set of people. To say the least. Um, <laughs> there, there are some, some very vocal folks who, who are very unhappy about that, including at the Granite uh, School Board meeting uh, this past week. Yeah, talk, so, wait, so for people who don't know. The, the meeting had to adjourn early. Police were involved. It was, uh, it was a, a pandemonium kind of a scene from from what I understand and uh, and and so but the reason why of course that that schools uh, the governor said we are keeping this mask mandate through the end of the school year and the reason why they're doing this because um, a lot of kids can't get vaccines yet it's 16 and up so some high school kids can and hopefully soon it'll be opened up to uh, to 12 and up so so all that to the good but right now a lot of kids can't get that vaccine and and the studies have shown that when you wear the mask when you do the distancing that um, that transmission rates are very low and we we want Want kids to be in school you know mm -hmm. we, we want them to um to be learning in school and i know my my school age child is is much better at school <laughs> in person versus trying to teach teach at home mm -hmm. so um so those are all the reasons why and and of course this isn't unique to utah other places have also had these very vocal calls to to drop mask mandates and some places are doing that before the end of the year um but it's it's a minority now of course um in the fall uh it sounds like things will be different that there won't be a mask mandate for schools anymore and hopefully by then there'll be a, a, a decent portion of, of vaccination rates among those those kids who are able to get them. Yeah so just a, just a moment on that Ben because I, I know you've talked to people about it as well it was a recent poll from the the Kaiser Family Foundation people are really trying to understand will people get their kids vaccinated you know what will it be right at the beginning will they wait and see and this number said 29 percent of the parents this is across the country say that they will vaccinate their children right away 32 percent of them said that they would wait to see what happens 15 percent said only if the school requires what what are you hearing from people and your expectation based on those conversations in Utah? Because we're not going to get any kind of herd immunity without our children being vaccinated. Well, the, la the latest thing that we heard from the Utah Department of Health when they presented to a legislative committee that I was in was that they expect herd immunity through vaccination by the end of this summer, which is really good. And we have had really good vaccination rates so far. You know, to be clear, with the end game bill, these were all numbers negotiated by the Department of Health. These are all signs of really good progress. We've hit those thresholds for vaccinations. So I think you can expect to see people We've had a high adoption rate so far. People want the vaccine. People have really tried to get it. Um, and, and the state is now trying to find ways to make sure that people who just their schedule hasn't worked out have, are getting it. And I think when you bring that down to 12 to 15, uh, including them, that is going to also probably see a high adoption rate, uh, which is all good things in terms of so you don't have to wear masks, so mm -hmm. you don't have to physical distance, you don't have to do all those things anymore. And, and it, you know, the state epidemiologist yesterday, uh, Dr. Angela Dunn said that getting 12 to 15 year olds is the next big step for the state because it will really cause cases to plummet, which again lifts all the restrictions that we technically just already lifted, but it lifts all those restrictions and it removes all of those uh, barriers that we've all been living under for the last year. Well, there's been such an interesting conversation and uh, it, there's been a, a thread through all of it too about the, you know, the impacts um, of certain populations in the state, which impacts politics, impacts our health. Uh, all the disparities that exist are just part of the political process, but part of being uh, a Utahn as well. Uh, and Natalie, I wanna ask you about that. You just released yesterday a, a really insightful uh, piece uh, with as you've been re researching uh, diversity in the state of Utah. You know, we talk about you know demographics as destiny. We often talk about that in terms of politics, for example, but, we, but, but what you've just laid bare in the research that you submitted yesterday is everything, uh, you know, where we live, where we go to school, how, how long we live. So many things are, are, are really based on, um, on these demographics about where we, where we are in those demographics. Will you please tell us about the study itself and a couple key findings? Because it's not often you get a mirror that really, you really just hold up and you see for real what's happening. Yeah, happy to do that, Jason. And mirror is the right way to think of it. Uh, we took a collective look in the mirror. It was uh, asked of us by the business community, uh, sponsored by Zions Bank. And we basically looked at health, housing, education, the economy, and then 50 some odd indicators uh, by race and, uh, you know, concluded that there are significant racial, ethnic and sex disparities in our state. That was finding number one as we looked in the mirror. Uh, number two, 
would be uh, that our community recognizes that we can do a lot better. And we reached out to you know political leaders, business leaders, the interfaith community, the multicultural community, all said we can do better. And then third, the, the study points out our strengths so that we can build from our strengths and we have nation leading social capital, family stability, uh, economic equality and upward mobility. And so those are, that's in a nutshell, those are the findings, but a very uh, consequential uh, research report from the Gardner Institute. Uh -huh. What happens next? I, I know the great thing about the Gardner Policy Institute is you mostly, you, you well, you always, right? You just shed light on the issue. Uh, what what yeah. are you hearing is going to happen next as a state, as we look at issues uh, of, of disparities, uh, you know, in, in all the demographics in the state of Utah? Yeah. Jason, it's a foundational piece because before this, we all talked, but we didn't know the data. Now we have the data in a very credible uh, way presented to us. We're not aware of any other state that's done anything quite like this. So the next steps are for decision makers, our leaders, to look at this data and, and internalize it and think, what, what do we do? Uh, and I think it's a moment of clarity for our state. Yes. So, so, Ben, talk about that for just a moment. Just through a political lens also, our demographics are changing. There are disparities everywhere, as we're seeing from the research we just got from Natalie. Talk about that from the, through a political lens. Well, and we saw it through the pandemic as well, uh, the disparities that existed. And it's partly why the state has shifted some of its focus on vaccinations, reaching some of these uh, underserved mm -hmm. communities. But yes, this, this translates to policy. This is something that every lawmaker on Capitol Hill can wave around and show and say, look, this is why, uh, you know, my task force on food insecurity or this is why my health care uh, bill should go forward, why you should pass this, why we should fund this with taxpayer dollars. This is data that lets them uh, tout that and make that decision. Yeah, so helpful to have the data. Sometimes it's really hard. You got to have it. Thank you for that, too, Natalie. And thank you all for your really great insights tonight on some very important issues. And thank you for watching The Hinckley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, we would like to recognize two members of our team who are leaving us this season, Dana Baracco and Brock Grossel. We wish them luck in all their future endeavors and thank them. And thank you for being with us. We'll see you next season.